So I propose that, uh, as we have a quorum, we go into public session. At five, at the chair in the, the house at five. So I'm sure you manage without me, though. Well, I know it's difficult. We do our best. I know, I understand. They appreciate that. Um, <coughs> so we're going to go into public session. Is that agreed? So we are going to now meet uh, with Dr. Scally. So can we ask him to come in and take a seat? Yeah. Alan? Oh, here it is. Sorry, he's got it. Yeah. So we are now in public session and the purpose of the meeting is to meet with Dr Scally on the supplementary report of the scoping inquiry into cervical check. And just to remind members that Dr Scally and Dr Denton need to be uh, out of here by five at the latest. It does, that's so it's not a target. It's, thank you. On behalf of the committee, uh, again, I'd like to welcome you, Dr. Scally and Dr. Denton, and also Ms. Sh uh, Shane, or Mr. Shane McQuillan. Thank you very much for, for coming. Uh, Mr. Shane McQuillan, partner in Crown Ireland, who led the team providing logistical project management, investigative and analytic analytical support to the inquiry. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of 17 2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in relation to their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that where possible you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any opening statement that you have, I don't think you have an opening statement, can be published on the committee's website after this meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside of the houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Uh, so we are going to start proceedings. I don't know if you want to make some opening remarks, Dr. Just very quickly, if I may, uh, I, I uh, would like to leave you as much time as possible um, for your purposes rather than mine. So I just wanted to say that uh, uh, thank you very much for having me back again. I'm very pleased to be uh, here to discuss my uh, supplementary report, which was published a couple of weeks ago. Uh, as you know, uh, when I started this uh, scoping inquiry um, May last year, there were six labs known about. Uh, by the time I uh, finished my main report and published it in September, uh, that number um, was 11. And at that point in time, uh, we had only uncovered some of those labs fairly shortly before I was publishing the report. So I wasn't convinced we'd yet got to the bottom of the matters to do with uh, additional labs. So I suggested to the Minister that there should be a supplementary report on labs, and this is what you have uh, before you. And uh, as you will know, by the time I uh, finished my supplementary report, that number of labs had uh, risen to 16. Uh, as well as dealing with those issues, uh, the report also deals with uh, the issue of accreditation systems, as um, we found out that there were uh, two accreditation systems and uh, there were questions raised, and rightly so, about the comparability uh, of those two accreditation systems. So that's an issue that we looked at and reported on in the supplementary report. Um, and at the heart of uh, a lot of what the report deals with are the issues of procurement and contracting and how those were conducted, how they were uh, enforced. Uh, or, or not enforced or not operated. Um, and there was one final uh, section, which is a short section, but it is about how we, uh, uh, we deal with error. And uh, 
my uh, concern that the system for dealing with clinical error is not uh, is not fit for purpose at the, at the present time. So, uh, Chairman, that's just a, 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 a brief summary of what is in the report, and I'm very happy, and my colleagues will be very happy to take uh, help you with your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Scully. So, uh, we, we hope we can keep it to to one round, uh, if we can. We'll see how things work out. Uh, but just to be conscious of the time, f uh, five o'clock, Dr. Scully has to leave. So uh, our first uh, member to contribute is uh, Deputy Stephen Donnelly. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> Dr. Scully, Dr. Denton, uh, Mr. McMillan, you're all very welcome. I just want to start by, by, um, by saying uh, thanks and just acknowledging the work that you've done. Uh, you were brought into the eye of a, a storm with an awful lot of, there was a lot of political heat, but much more importantly, there were a lot of women all over the country who were very worried and very scared about uh, questions around the clinical quality of the testing that had been done, the labs that were being used, um, and so forth. And, and I think your expertise and your hard work uh, over many months, I guess over a year now, on, on several reports, uh, has gone an awful long way to, to that. So I just want to acknowledge that work and, and, uh, and thank you for that. Um, can I ask, <clears throat> I'm going to get into, in, in a few minutes, some of the questions around these extra labs. I, I think many of us were shocked, I, <laughs> I imagine you were kind of shocked yourselves, to go from six labs to 11 labs to 16 labs, and the very serious questions that, that raised in terms of how did it happen, were these labs of sufficient quality, and, and, and so forth, and you've detailed that in, in, in your report, and I, I'd just like to talk to that in a second. But before I do, if I could just pull out of the detail for a moment, um, there, there are still an awful lot of uh, women around the country whose confidence has been shaken in this program. Uh, my understanding of the program is that it, is, it is, has been a highly effective program in terms of clinical outcomes, with, a, with about a 7% reduction year on year in cervical cancer uh, that can be linked right back to the start of the program. It wasn't happening anyway. There is a, there is a, there is a, a link presumably a causal relationship. Um, and indeed, as an ancillary, there'll be many other people looking at the other screening services and saying, well, you know, is bowel screening good? Is breast screening good? Because, you know, these questions have been raised about um, uh, cervical check. Can I ask you, my understanding from the, your first report, when we all met and we asked you, and it's in your report, is that at a clinical level, putting aside the issues of governance, the very real issues you've uncovered, but that at a clinical level, the program as it ran, and the program as it still runs to this day, is of the highest quality, and that the issues that have been surfaced are issues of governance, there is, there, there's issues of non-disclosure, and very real issues in terms of a patient's right to know but that ultimately at a clinical level, this has been and remains clinically sound. Um, my understanding, but I'd, I'd really like your view, you know, at the top international levels, and that people in Ireland, women who are looking at the cervical check program, have every reason to have confidence in the clinical efficacy of the program and its ability, imperfect as it is, to, to, to help in terms of detecting and uh, treating cervical cancer and precancer. Is, is that still your view, having now had many more months to look at, look into the weeds even further? Um, yes, thank you. It's, good. it's a very good point and it is worthwhile, I think, uh, reinforcing that it is a good program uh, and that it has produced real results and also that the potential uh, is great for it to produce really outstanding results, I think, uh, ironically, as a, almost as a result of the attention that has been paid to it over the last couple of years. And I absolutely know, talking to the women that uh, affected and the families affected, that they want it to be a really excellent. They're totally committed to it. And it's very interesting at, at some of the meetings if, uh, if there is criticism of the programme, it's not about the principle of the programme at all or even the general operation of the program. It's, it's about the way this particular issue was, was handled. Um, in terms of its comparability in internationally, I think it stands up well in comparison. Uh, we did look at the quality assurance around the other screening programs, uh, uh, but a very, on a very superficial level um, during the main report. But as you'll appreciate, uh, we got into far more 
uh, problematic areas in the, in the cervical screening program that I could have ever imagined. So that's where our concentration was. But we didn't find major problematic uh, areas in the other um, programs. Uh, what, what I am pleased about is that uh, some of the changes that uh, HSE have put in place have been not just around the cervical screening program but across the whole management of, of the programs and they've brought in people who uh, uh, I'm convinced will uh, improve the situation, improve the management, improve the coherence of it. If I could just ask uh, Dr Denton uh, to uh, comment because uh, uh, she has a considerable amount of international experience and, uh, and this issue of its comparability is something that she and I have discussed recently. Would you like to comment? So, um, I mean, it certainly compares well with cervical cancer prevention strategies um, uh, that are operable in many other countries. Um, when it comes down to it, it is a, an organised screening programme with a high uptake, um, with uh, strong pathways to make sure that women are followed throughout their lives, um, so it's not just a series of one-off tests. Um, and there's not so many countries that have an organised screening programme like that. So that's, you know, it's starting off uh, in a very positive position. And um, as Gabriel says, you know, the, the moves to um, improve the um, uh, sensitivity of the test by moving towards HPV as a primary screening test are underway, as I understand it. So, you know, that will uh, lead to... Uh, you know, further improvements in the international league tables, if you like. But, um, uh, you know, ultimately it does compare well to what's available in many other European countries, as well as more widely. Thank you. Uh, could I just, uh, just <coughs> add yeah. one more thing? Yeah. If there was one thing that would really improve uh, the screening uh, programme, it is the screening programme reaching out to all those women who haven't come forward yet uh, uh, to be screened. And that's where the big gain for, for uh, the women of Ireland would be, if, if the programme could reach those women and convince them uh, and, and really improve the, the screening rates, that would deliver enormous benefit. So there, there are three issues to this which a lot of focus has been on over the last year. One is the issue of non-disclosure. On non-disclosure, is it still your view that there is not a clinical link between the cases of non-disclosure which have been identified and, and clinical outcomes for the, for the women. In other words, had the women been told, is it still your view? Sir, well, sorry, it may not have been your view. I don't want to refer. Is it your view, uh, having had more time to look at it, that whilst the non-disclosure was unacceptable, that had there been disclo a, a timely disclosure, would it have affected the clinical outcome for the women involved? I don't believe uh, it would have done. Yeah. Uh, these women already were in treatment for uh, cervical cancer, which is why that there, there was a look back performed on their previous slides. Yeah. Uh, and I can't see any real reason why there should have, be, uh, should have been an effect, there would have been an effect, because the clinician who was treating them knew the result mm. uh, of... Uh, uh, the audit, uh, the fact that they didn't disclose it to, to the women uh, shouldn't have altered their treatment of the, of the women in, in, in the slightest. That thank, would be my, thank you. Be my view. Yeah, th thank you, because that, because that got lost la last year. Uh, there, in fact, there was a lot of misleading yeah. uh, comment around that, around that issue at that time, a lot yeah. of misleading comment. Thank you. So uh, the, the areas that were looked at and the areas that the, the public have focused on, one was the issue of non-disclosure, which we've talked about, should never have happened but didn't have a clinical impact. Um, the second is what we've all become aware of, which is the imperfections of the test. That unfortunately, it is an imperfect test, and, and, and we know that. And then the third is the hopefully very small number of cases where there was actually, there is actually negligence, where, where the, the, the misses were beyond the imperfections of the test, and obviously that's a matter for the tribunal and the courts to, to, to decide. G given that then, you, you believe that from a clinical perspective, the programme to date and the programme going forward is clinically sound and women should have confidence in it? Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, the, one, the, the one area that concerns me greatly about the non-disclosure and its, its effect is not the effect on the treatment in the past. It's um, 
the effect that it has had on the relationship between the women and their clinicians when the women found out. I mean, these, the women felt betrayed, really. Uh, some, in some cases, they were lied to. And uh, that damaging of the uh, patient-clinician relationship is deeply unhelpful, particularly when, there isn't a, when the woman doesn't have a choice, yeah. really. And uh, that's where I, I, I think the, the, the problem in terms of clinical services, which is why I've always um, advocated uh, that there should be uh, an attempt at reconciliation between the clinician and the woman. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and in cases where that has happened, and I know, I know women who have taken it into their own hands and have, have gone and talked to uh, their clinician, made appointments specifically to discuss what happened and find out the truth about the non disclosures that has greatly helped the clinical relationship. So that's the area of uh, uh, clinical care that I, I, that, uh, I, I, I would have a concern about, yeah. and, and I've expressed, that, expressed yeah. that concern. Thank you. One more question. question and Thanks, sure, sure. Thank you. Can I ask then, uh, so on the labs, obviously a lot of your focus and a lot of the team's focus has been on this extra 10 labs. And my understanding of your conclusion is that uh, whilst I think we all accept it shouldn't have, sh this clearly should not have happened, and represented a risk that having looked into the risk, you didn't find evidence of um, poor practice and poor quality. One of, the, one of the questions that women have put to me is, they said, look, that, that's great and that's reassuring, but isn't it the case that some of these labs have, have closed? And is Dr. Scally, has he had enough access to the data for closed labs to be able to say, whilst we found no evidence of wrongdoing, I guess the question that's put to me is, how confident is he that, well maybe, sorry, wrongdoing is the wrong word, that they found no, no evidence of, of substandard quality. How close is that to being confident that there was no substandard quality, because they're, they're, they're different tests. Of, of course they are, and, and you're quite right to point out the, the difference. Uh, we, we are only able to make a, a, a judgment caveat it with it's on the basis of the information we had. And we had a great deal of difficulty, at, well, obviously, firstly, finding out uh, the, of the existence of, of laboratories, and secondly, getting data for those laboratories, particularly when they'd already closed. And, and, and we must remember that for most of these labs, we're talking about uh, nine or ten years ago. So, and uh, staff were not available to talk to people. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, uh, people from our team uh, visited the companies and visited many of the labs and went through the data uh, for uh, the labs. Uh, for, for all of the women's, the Irish women's slides that were, were sent. And uh, there wasn't any indication that any of these labs uh, were particularly problematic. Having said that, we may learn more from the RCOG uh, about uh, whether uh, there, are, there is a, a pattern that is statistically significant in any way. Um, but that's a judgment for later. Uh, Dr. Dennett, do you want to say anything about that issue? Um. Well, I mean, just that in terms of the, the original report has got several recommendations around the quality of data. Uh, we, we do need to remember that the data um, on key quality issues for these labs was received. It was just aggregated into the, the whole return for, for, for each supplier or each, each, um, uh, each company. So... Um, it is in there, but it's, it's merged with a much greater volume that was done in the main sites. Um, but, you know, the same caveats to the uh, analysis that we were able to do on the data available apply across the, across the board. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank um, before I bring in Deputy O'Reilly, I, I just have an issue which pr probably isn't covered in your report, and that issue is the frontline staff that are delivering, delivering the service, uh, both smear takers and in the offices and, and answering questions uh, from women, uh, and also the staff in colposcopy clinics are really under severe stress because of the anxiety that the issue has, has raised. And obviously many women are very uncertain and anxious about delayed tests 
they begin to question the, the accuracy of the tests when they get them. Uh, there probably is more pressure on colposcopy clinics now because there are, there are more referrals, because people are, are worried and, and anxious and to make sure that they don't miss anything. Uh, there's greater referrals to colposcopy clinics, which are now under pressure. Have you any view on how the staff can be supported because a lot of people, a lot of staff have resigned. Uh, they have become ill uh, from the stress and it's, it's a huge problem now in trying to cope with the, 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 the uh, provision of the service. Yes, I, I think that is a problem. It is a, I think also the greater emphasis on uh, the outcomes for individual cytoscreeners screeners, I think, also places pressure on individual cytoscreeners screeners in the labs as, uh, as well. Uh, but I am obviously concerned about the staff, and particularly having met uh, uh, very many of the staff in, in, in Limerick and Cervical Check uh, and who have done a fantastic job and uh, under very difficult circumstances and on all, on all the pressures and I, I, I do understand that there are difficulties there and, and these I have discussed with HSE on a, on a, a regular basis and I, and I know that the, the, the team do understand that and are trying to take action to fill posts to create additional posts when they, where they were needed because some people were doing more than one job that had their jobs merged together sort of and uh, and also give people better job definition because there's nothing worse than people not knowing what actually their job is and uh, I think in, in my main report I identified that one of the major problems was that almost no one had a current job description saying what their job actually was so I, I have uh, discussed that with HAC. I, I think, Chair, uh, uh, if I may, I, I think you, th that is a good question and it should be addressed to HSE. but I will be continuing to discuss that matter with them. And as you know, the Minister has asked me to uh, re review the implementation of the uh, recommendations. And uh, so I will be discussing uh, these matters further with HSE myself. You may tell me this is not a fair question to you, but I'd like to put it to you anyway. In, in, in the recent uh, judgment, uh, the, the judge, Judge Cross, uh, spoke about absolute confidence in relation to the reading of smears, that if there was any doubt in the smear reader's mind, that that should not be deemed to be a normal smear. Have, have you any comment on how that is going to be viewed. I know it's under appeal in the court. I'm not asking you in any way in relation to that, but in relation to the term absolute confidence, um, how does that fit in to... Well, I, I wouldn't want to comment on the judgment particularly, yes. as you said, it's subject to appeal, but one's got to understand, uh, and I, I pointed out actually in, in the supplementary report the difference between uh, screening programmes and normal health care. Uh, and uh, screen programs are done on a mass basis and they are reliant upon the quality of the tests as well as the quality of the people who read those tests when, when there's a visual uh, element uh, to it. And uh, they're also reliant on being uh, uh, the cost benefit of it, uh, of it all. Uh, now, a very good example is uh, the decision in the United States to shift their guidelines to having, from having annual tests to having three or five yearly tests, and they did that on the basis that if they had uh, tests too often, i.e. annually, that more women would be identified with uh, problems that which uh, over time would resolve by themselves and they would have unnecessary treatment and that uh, the side effects of some of that treatment in terms of uh, premature labour uh, and, uh, and miscarriage uh, might well outweigh any potential benefit that, uh, from what was picked up. So uh, it is a balance, yet that balance can hardly, I think, enter into uh, a judgment in an individual case where some, someone has, been, uh, has not had something picked up that should have been picked up. So I, I think the, the overall balance of a screening programme is different from uh, the balance in any one case. Uh, I, you know, the absolute certainty, uh, I know, was applied to uh, 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 someone carrying out, out the screening. Uh, it, it, you know, I've been a doctor a long time and been involved in, in many, uh, of, uh, many uh, problems in, in medical care. And 
I must say, every time I come across a doctor who is absolutely certain that they are right, I worry. Uh, I'd rather have uh, doctors with a degree of scepticism about uh, that, that are rethinking their judgments all the time and, and, uh, and triangulating them and making sure they're right. Uh, but no doubt that will all play out uh, in, in the Supreme Court. I wish them luck with that. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy O'Reilly. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, and thank you, Dr. Denton, Dr. Scallion, and Mr. McQuillan for, for coming in this afternoon and for always actually making yourselves available uh, to, answer, to answer questions. It is uh, very, very welcome. Um, you know, you, you say for an organised screening program, uh, it, it, it's a decent program. It is. I'm, I'm, I'm more than uh, more than happy to say I'm a, a beneficiary of that uh, of that program in more ways than one. Uh, and I, it is a program I would be very grateful for um, in in many respects. So there was a lot of what I felt to be sort of disrespectful comment at the time, uh, in particular. Uh, directed at the women who used the service that somehow we didn't understand that it was a, a screening service and we thought it was diagnostics. Of course, we didn't um, because most of us will, uh, will speak to our doctor and we're, we're, we're adults, otherwise we're not getting the test. Um, but I do think the withholding of information, okay, and that, that's uh, where the, the, the problems lay, uh, is certainly a fundamental aspect but it strikes me that your job would have been an awful lot easier in terms of chasing down uh, where the, the, there were issues if those laboratories had been based here. Um, and the decision, as we heard from the, uh, the Academy of Medical Laboratory Scientists, the decision to outsource was a political one. It wasn't a, a clinical one. They, they never advised it. In fact, the very opposite, they looked for a, a small amount of investment from the government at the time to, to scale up the labs and to, to make the labs fit for purpose so that we could have continued to test here. That's not to say that the same issues regarding withholding information wouldn't have happened. They possibly would have happened. But the capacity to cite the labs and find out exactly where the tests were, because a lot of women were concerned when they found that there was outsourcing, which is bad enough, re-outsourcing and then in some instances re-outsourcing again that, that's very that's very worrying but I'm just referring to page 24 of this of sorry 36 of the supplementary report and it says the NCSS specifically stated that they would not be supportive of this aspect of the plan but when issuing a new request for tender later in the same year the NCSS reduced the focus on capacity by almost eliminating it from the scoring despite these issues having occurred and again, we see quality assurance declined from 25% weighting in 08 to a 15% weighting by 2012. Now, that, to me, and just to use layman's terminology, that's, that's screening on the cheap. You know, I mean, that's reducing the emphasis on quality and capacity and increasing the emphasis on price. So they were chasing down the costs. They weren't, uh, they, they weren't keeping a close eye on quality. So in terms of quality assurance, uh, my understanding is that site visits uh, were not conducted. Well, clearly, if they were being conducted, we'd have known where the sites were. So site visits were not conducted. Um, and I know that I did ask you this when, when, we, met, uh, when we met previously, but I'm, I'm interested to know why it is that they would have chased price and price reductions instead of quality and capacity. Because remember, the outsourcing happened because at the time we were told it was a capacity issue, um, which could have been dealt with here in, in, in this state, but wasn't. And then it was outsourced for that reason. Um, but I'm just wondering, in terms of ensuring that that doesn't happen again, uh, would you be confident that uh, a heavier emphasis, and I'm talking about when the TV cameras are shut off and away from this, that a heavier emphasis uh, on quality will prevail, which hadn't uh, up until this point. And also, if you, you could offer a, a view as to who it was that was driving that agenda. Yes. Maybe Mr McQuillan would like to come in at, at some point on, on this. Um, I think uh, the situation is even slightly worse, I think, probably than, than would appear on the bald reading of the figures because uh, part of the change, there would have been a change in the weightings anyway because some factors, instead of giving a weighting, were altered during uh, subsequent tenders to either pass-fail issues. So then, then the weighting elements 
uh, you would have, uh, uh, the factors that were left, you would have uh, expected them to have an increased percentage rather than uh, staying still or decreasing. Uh, so you're quite right. Uh, uh, we did not come across uh, in the uh, documentation, uh, as I, I, I state there, uh, why they were subject to uh, such substantial reductions uh, in weighting. Uh, one, can, uh, one can only assume, in fact, uh, how could there be any other explanation that, that indeed price was, uh, became a much more important factor in, in, the, whole, in the whole process and that they were, they were seeking to uh, stimulate as much competition uh, and uh, drive down the price as possible. I, I, mean, I, I, I can't see how there could be any other uh, explanation for it. I don't know if Ms. McGuinn wants to. Yes, uh, thanks. Um, certainly in terms of looking at the documentation from the original procurement processes back 10 years ago or more, um, one thing that was reported in the um, final report from uh, September of last year was that much of the documentation was incomplete much of it was missing. We couldn't get a lot of the, the documents in terms of the procurement issues that existed at the time. Um, so I think we simply don't know why the criteria were set as they were. But certainly it is surprising, I think, that um, a qualitative criterion of 40% would be reduced to 15 And that would, I think, tend to suggest that the service was being looked at more as a kind of commodity rather than something that was quality driven. Certainly very surprising that it would be down at that low level. Um, in terms of the current position, as Gabriel mentioned earlier on, um, we have been engaging recently with the HSE to look at the implementation of the recommendations from September last year. And um, it would be our view that there is a much, much greater focus within the HSE now on the qualitative aspects, both in terms of the arrangements that they're entering into with laboratories um, at the present time, and also in terms of the inspections and the, the, I think, quite detailed work that they're doing to visit sites and to look at the arrangements that are in place. So I think it is fair to say that they have certainly learned the lessons that we have reported. As to why things happened 10 years ago, I think a lot of that is simply lost in the absence of documentation. Yeah, and that is very regrettable, actually, that oh, that documentation mm. is not available. Um, but, um, Dr Denton, you refer to how the screening programme compares well with others, but I would have thought that other programmes would have a, you know, an emphasis on quality. And the organised screening programme is of this nature. Am I right? Is it that, like, the things that work well on it, the fact that every woman um, you know, between 18 and 65 is included and that you're written to and that you're followed up and that... Is it that that you're referring to, rather than necessarily the the, the, the practice? Because, to me, if you're comparing with other jurisdictions, I, I'd like us to be faring well in jurisdictions where they put a really heavy emphasis on quality. Um, and you know, I, I, I say this as someone who has a material interest in it. Um, you know, and I, so I, I would prefer rather than I mean the administrative stuff. Certainly, we, we, we can tick that box. You get your letter, then you know you get your results, you get your follow up, you get your letter again to call you. They don't make it easy for you to slip through the. Uh, they don't make it easy for you to slip through the system. And if you move house and forget, then there's an ad on the radio. And you know it's, it, it, it's organised in that way. But to me, to compare favourably with another jurisdiction, uh, I, I would imagine that we would want to be not just on the administrative side, and clearly we are, um, as, as you've outlined, but actually in terms of driving quality and you know driving that uh, as quality and capacity up front rather than uh, price all of the time. Yes, yeah. I would agree. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, could I just say the recommendation 22 uh, that's, that's referred to, 22 in the, in the main report read, uh, cervical check should ensure that its procurement approach maintains a, balance, a balanced focus on qualitative factors, supplier experience and innovation alongside cost considerations. And that's something certainly uh, having been asked to overview the implementation, that is something we will be looking at because uh, you're quite... You're quite right, Deputy, but this is an issue uh, that has been picked up and, and, and mentioned to me by many women. It is, and it's one of those things that, that, that I would say is, is a kind of a natural consequence of outsourcing, because once you go down that road, you're constantly chasing the, the price and, uh, rather than, than other matters. And when you outsource, you, you do outsource to a certain extent your capacity to overview uh, and oversee the quality assurance. Now, we see a very hands-off approach uh, in terms of quality assurance, and, you know, 
uh, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but the, this retrospective accreditation, I say that, that causes me a, a huge amount of difficulties. Um, and it's not something, and it is something that has been raised with me um, by women who are kind of like, how could you do that? Uh, how could you retrospectively accredit something um, when it no longer exists? That, that, is a, that, is a, that is a serious difficulty. But again, you know, th that, that sort of issue is a natural consequence, I believe, of, of, of outsourcing in the first place. But, um, just in terms of the, uh, the RCOG review, is it the expectation from that that we will get a breakdown on a laboratory by laboratory basis? Um, that, that, that any of what I think they're referred to as cluster errors, now I'm not, uh, no, not very technically minded, but I think that the term is cluster errors, that if they exist, that they will be identified by the RCOG review? Uh, well, I can't speak for the view. As you know, it was set up entirely and absolutely separately. Uh, from, so I, I, I can't I'll speak for that. I don't know whether Dr. Dent wants to say anything about that uh, at all. I don't know what their reporting mechanism uh, will be or how they will structure uh, their reporting. Well, on the basis of the information that you had access to, you weren't given a laboratory by laboratory breakdown? No. Is it available or did, was uh, it, did you just not feel it was necessary? Uh, well, we had real, for some of the laboratories, we had real difficulty of finding out even the number of Irish women slides that were sent to particular laboratories. And we mm -hmm. had to uh, uh, eventually get some of the data via the laboratory's internal billing systems mm -hmm. uh, rather than the clinical systems. So uh, the chances of getting clinical data uh, linked to individual uh, laboratories on, on the broad range uh, is... Uh, uh, will be difficult and it will be interesting to see how much mm. information the RCOG... So on that basis, uh, okay. if there were cluster errors, we may never know. Because I, I, as long I would, as it comes out in, in the end, OK, you know what I mean? On, I think on, we'll, on balance, I, I, you I, wouldn't... I, I, I think it would be wrong for me to comment in advance of seeing it's the better. data. Yeah. I, I really would. Thank you very much. Of course, you're going to have to vacate the chair, so I think this is an opportune time for Dr. O, Deputy O'Reilly to take the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. A wee promotion there, that's excellent. Kelly, go right. Dr. O'Reilly. <laughs> the doctor will see you now. Um, thank you, and thanks for the witnesses for coming in. I'm sure you look forward to today. Um, the, uh, I've a lot of questions. I won't get through them all today. It's impossible in the time frame. So, what, you know, after hours and hours and days and weeks of discussions with patient advocates, <laughs> In particular, the questions I've lined up, basically, are their questions. They've asked me to ask these questions. So I won't get through them all today. So I'll end up writing to you with a lot of the questions. And I'm glad you're staying on to work with, with the department uh, to be able to answer them. Um, I have a lot of issues, questions, and gaps in the report. I've done a full chronology of the re what happened, how it happened since the last report and the timelines, and I'm concerned about certain issues. So I'm going to ask about a few of them now, and then I'll write you on the rest of them. Um, in relation to the patient advocates, at any point, and I have the terms of reference here, um, at any point were you of the view that it wasn't your role um, to investigate the quality assurance in the labs? Uh, th that it was I of the view that it wasn't my assurance to investigate, wasn't my role to investigate quality assurance in the labs. I, I th uh, well, it's I, I think it's obviously part of the terms of reference. That's the only reason I asked. Yes, uh, we, we did look at quality assurance in the labs, and we looked at uh, issues of accreditation in the laboratories, in particular. The accreditation at, and quality assurance are two different things. Yes, uh, and, and we looked at the uh, a quality assurance processes that were being applied to the labs by the uh, HSE and when lab visits took place uh, I think on each of those visits the data was looked at in terms of the 
uh, quality performance yes. of the laboratories. Uh, yes, I think, uh, I think one could okay, say... Okay, so you, you never communicated to any of the patient representatives that quality assurance was not part of your role? Um, and not that I can uh, uh, imagine okay, that I, I did. I just, want, I just want to find clarity in that. Okay. In relation to quality assurance and accreditation, there are two very distinctive parts of the terms of reference. What date, and I've asked you this, and I have a letter which um, the, the, or the Minister read out in the Dáil on Tuesday, which I didn't know he had been sent, because I didn't CC, it wasn't CC to him according to my copy of it. Um, when, what date, because I still don't understand from what you said in the letter, what date did you find out that the lab in Manchester was not accredited? Uh, well, I, I, can, I, I can understand why you wouldn't be satisfied with the answer to that, because there is no answer to that. Uh, my, uh, this was an iterative process. So when I found out about the Salford lab, I uh, was very surprised about it. How did you find out? Uh, we were told in October by the HSE, uh, and it had been revealed to the HSE. I think I covered this in the report. Yeah. It was and you, revealed, visit, you visited it in January? And we visited it in, in January. And I uh, looked at the issue of accreditation, as we did with all labs, and I looked at the accreditation schedule uh, that was on the INAB website, and I noted that there was only one address on that schedule of accredit accreditation. So the which, HSE didn't tell you about the lack of accreditation, you found out yourself? Well, if you just let me okay. continue. Okay. Uh, uh, and. Uh, there was only one address, and that was the uh, Dublin address and not the uh, Salford address. Uh, and I asked about accreditation, and I, I, was, uh, I, and I have been repeatedly assured by MedLab their position always was and remains that that lab was accredited by INAB, by the accreditation okay. board. Uh, I explored that with uh, INAB, and I think they, uh, I, they were quite... They were quite clear in their view, uh, and they uh, wrote to me on the subject, and I, I, I quoted it in the report, where... Um, I've read the report, it's okay, yeah, you don't have to repeat it. Where they said, MedLab's past and current accreditation extends to all accredited activity undertaken within the scope of accreditation by MedLab employees included within the scope of the accreditation assessment, including the cytology, the cytology work carried out in Manchester. So all current and past activities. So uh, MedLab believe that it is accredited and uh, INAB believe it is accredited. Uh, and I think I, in the report I expressed my incredulity really at that, that INAB did not know of this laboratory yet uh, feel comfortable to say that it was, a, uh, it was always accredited. So, okay. uh, it, it, that, I, I'm, that I, is I've, the position. I'm not being rude, I just I know I've restricted time. Um, I still don't understand how there isn't one date where you personally found out from somebody, or yourself, your own research, that the lab wasn't accredited. But for me, being honest with you, it doesn't, just, you, just doesn't make sense. There has to be some date where you found out that it wasn't accredited. Well, uh, and let me just finish. I just want to confirm. You didn't find out from the HSE. You found out yourself through checking the website and all of that, which you've listed off in my letter uh, that you sent to the minister as well. Um, so it was, it was, you didn't find out from the HSE. And there is no one date, which I don't, it's just, just for me, is, a, is an issue. And the other thing is, you visited in January. You accepted what they told you, okay? You accepted what they told you. It turned out to be, as you said in your report, like, you know, it, it turned out to be wrong. It turned out that it wasn't accredited, like, which is a real issue for a lot of us, okay? But you accepted that. And the concern, of course, is if you accepted it in this scenario, subsequently found out because of whatever reasons, are there other instances where you accepted accreditation because the company told you regarding the lab as well. well I, I think we're cross purposes here, Deputy. Uh, according to uh, INAB, the lab in Salford is accredited 
and always has been accredited. So uh, I can't find out that it wasn't accredited. They're telling me it always was accredited. I am, uh, what I have difficulty with is the fact that they are prepared to make that statement when they didn't even know of its existence. That's, that's my key, key issue. A very specific question in relation to when you when yes. you became aware. So can you address that? Because that's something I think we, we all sort yes. of want to. Yes, I, I suppose it, it was, uh, I became worried about the issue when I went to check the schedule of accreditation and only found one address on it. Uh, uh, how much that means, I don't know, because uh, that second address has now been added. Uh, it was added at uh, the end of May this, this year, so the Salford address is now on the schedule of accreditation, but it was, it was only added I in, think the in Chair had to be very helpful there. In our letter you said it should have been listed on the schedule of accreditation granted. So instead of maybe saying, when did you find out it didn't have accreditation, when did you find out that it should have been on the schedule? And it wasn't. There um, has to be a date. There has to be a date for everything. Well, I, 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 I'm not sure when the, the date was, but... Uh, but I asked the same be... question when the report came out, to be fair. Yes, uh, because uh, it was an iterative process where I went through and looked for the schedule of accreditation. I was also uh, looking at INAB's capacity to accredit it somewhere that was not in the jurisdiction which is another issue. And uh, I eventually found, by reading their documentation, that uh, they had a system whereby if it was an Irish company and it had a small satellite operation in another jurisdiction, they could accredit okay. it. So uh, it was a, a whole series of dates that I was examining uh, the complicated uh, arena of how INAB Okay. Credits okay, just for the record, for me it's not credible that there isn't a date. There has to be a date. Well, I'm terribly sorry, Deputy. Just, I just I want to say that. I can't give you a precise date. Well, you might, you, well, you might reflect on it. Uh, last few questions. Um, so when it came to quality assurance and accreditation, we take it that, unlike the case where you went over in January to MedLab, took their word, and then subsequently through the whole process you've just outlined there, which is quite confusing, confusing to the public, I understand, to be fair. Um, we understand that you would have investigated the labs. I have a concern about the chronology of what happened because I believe, in fairness, what the Minister said to me in a parliamentary question on the 12th of February was accurate. What uh, the Secretary General said to me on February the 13th about the report being uh, already was accurate. And then obviously you had a meeting on the, on the 14th and you have this letter which you've now given to us for the 15th. But I want, well I, my real issue is we now know what happened in January in Manchester. We now know the process of the fact that you had to find out subsequently that there was issues with accreditation even though you had to take MedLab's uh, word for it previously. When you were going around the labs, the women who, of Ireland and the patient representatives really want to know there was a thorough investigation of all the labs, an investigation by the team, rather than taking the words of the labs. That's the first question. And the second question, how many of the 16 labs that we now know of, which is incredible, it went from 6 to 11 to 16, how many did you physically, you or your team physically visit? What percentage of them? Well. Let me return to the uh, INAP question. I didn't, uh, in fact, entirely opposite to what you said, I didn't take the word that, uh, from MedLab that the laboratory was accredited, which is why I went and checked the schedule. And uh, when I found it wasn't the schedule, I started asking questions uh, about that. So I didn't take the word from MedLab, and I, I, I wouldn't... You said to me you did. I, I wouldn't do that. They gave me the, uh, an assurance that it was accredited, but of course... I, as is fairly obvious, I didn't. And, uh, and the HSE didn't tell you uh, this? The H Sorry, Deputy. The HSE tell me. never informed you that the lab wasn't accredited? Uh, I don't. Th uh, no, the HSE and uh, didn't. I don't believe that the HSE ever mentioned accreditation okay. to me. 
Uh, in terms of the number of laboratories that were visited by the team personally, uh, Mr. Quinn? I believe we visited six, I think that's correct, Karen. Um, the nine, sorry, nine. Um, you might provide a schedule of dates we can and, do so, yeah. and all of that. I've asked for the question a number of times from the, the, the department, but I don't think mm -hmm. they wanted to give me until you finished here today. Certainly. So nine of the 16. Some of the laboratories that um, provided a service for cervical check no longer exist. And so seven, which is quite a high percentage, seven yeah. over 16 of the labs were not visited. That's correct, because they either no longer so exist. So that means that my, what I prescribed earlier on as regards what the women wanted as regards quality assurance was them to be investigated. That was not possible in seven of them. Is that correct? Well, we didn't visit some of them, um, some of them because they didn't exist anymore. There were two of them where there were extremely small volumes of activity going through. Um, one of them in Hawaii, we felt it probably wasn't conducive to trying to do the project efficiently to, to visit that laboratory. Okay, but let me just for the record say this. There are 16 labs. You provided now with a schedule. Seven of them were not visited, so they couldn't have been thoroughly investigated. I mean, as regards quality assurance, quality assurance and accreditation are two totally different things. Quality assurance needs investigation. Indeed, it does, Deputy. And, and I think, as we addressed in the earlier question, the data for the company, companies was examined, and that included the data from those, uh, all those laboratories. And my last it, question, very last question. It was physically impossible for us to visit laboratories that no longer... I accept that, but some of them does, do still exist. No, no longer existed. And uh, I'm sure you will understand that uh, the number of slides that were sent to some of the laboratories were so small that even if we looked at data relating to those slides, we'd have found nothing statistically... Okay, well, well the, schedule, the schedule will show in, all of that, in, to be in fair the, to you. In the numbers. Well, 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 that very last question, um, and it's, it's relating to, to, obviously, INAB. I, I believe, personally, Chair, I think at some point we should maybe bring in INAB and actually rele relevant people from the HSE to fill in a jigsaw here. Um, they're under a different department, but we're doing the Department of Business, but that shouldn't be an issue. Um, in relation to INAB, what communications, like all of us here have an issue, I hope I'm not speaking, but all of us have an issue, with, and you have an issue, with retrospective accreditation, particularly where there's no baseline. Because they couldn't have accredited it because they didn't know it existed. When you went and visited in That's January, absolutely correct. when you visited in January, you ex took, well, sorry, you, what MedLab said, well, what you, I, I, I haven't time to read from the letter, but they said it was accredited, okay? All right, and then subsequently to um, what was explained earlier, which I'll digest, we found out that it wasn't accredited. But what we really want to know is, at what point, or who told INAB it wasn't accredited? and that they had to go. So INAB visited on the 20... INAB, the accreditation for Sandyford is the 23rd of the 10th, 18. INAB visited them on the 17th of April. Their subsequent accreditation, which is Sandyford and Salford, is the 30th of May. The report comes out subsequent to that, your report. I want to fill in the gap of your visit in January, their visit on the 17th of April, and who told INAB? Because someone had to tell them, because they didn't know it existed. Uh, someone told them of its existence. Who told them that this existed and it didn't have accreditation? I told them of its existence, okay. Okay. and uh, they... What? No, there is, there is a difference of opinion here, actually, uh, because <laughs> MedLab argue that uh, INAB did know about its existence, and there was Look at the chronology. It started on the 1st of uh, February 2016, and the first communication which it's mentioned between INAB and MedLab was in October that year in a, a chain of emails, which were, uh, it was mentioned by the by, it wasn't the main purpose of the email. Uh, and, INAB, uh, uh, and INAB also uh, were in receipt of documentation for accreditation visits to Sandyford, which uh, in passing, mentioned uh, the existence of Manchester uh, in, in some obscure detail of, of, I think, which was what was a very large 
documentation. Uh, I, I don't regard that as adequate notification to INAB from MedLab. Okay, but did board. you ask INAB to go and visit? Did you? I know, but I just want to an answer if, to the question. If we have an opportunity, we'll, I, just, we can I want come an back. answer to the question. Did you ask INAB to visit? Did I ask them? No, I didn't request them to. So okay. we don't know who did. Deputy Durkin, I'm going to have to move on, Deputy Kelly, and hopefully we'll have an opportunity to come back. All Deputy right. Durkin, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. President, and thank Dr. Scalley and his colleagues for <coughs> coming back before the committee. Can I ask a question in relation to uh, the labs that are no longer in, exi in existence? Uh, can I ask about uh, the circumstances <coughs> in which they became obsolete? Do we know? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, okay. Um, in terms of the laboratories which are no longer in existence, uh, first of all, with regard to CPL, Clinical Pathology Laboratories in the United States, which is part of the Sonic Healthcare Group, um, they had a laboratory in Orlando which closed a couple of years ago. Um, that was one of the laboratories that had been involved in cervical check work back in the period 2010 to 2012. Why did it close? Is there a particular reason for its closure? Was there, were there complaints? Uh, was there uh, an investigation? What, uh, a lab normally wouldn't close voluntarily just because they had no work to do or something like that. I think our understanding was that it was commercial reasons within Sonic. We, didn't, uh, we weren't provided with detail as to why that had been the case, but it was reported in the, in the medical press in the US that it had Would well, it not have been a good idea to try to probe that a little bit further? Because if, if uh, I have a lab and I'm providing mm -hmm. a service, and I suddenly decide I'm going to close that. Why do I have to close it? Is it because there's something happening that I'm worried about? Is it because there have been a number of complaints expressed? Or is it because mm, management wasn't in accordance with the sta highest possible standards? What could it have been? <coughs> so, well, we know for a number of them um, that it was for reasons not like that. Very often they were small. With, with a small number of members of staff who retired or uh, uh, you know, left for natural reasons, if you like. Um, uh, in one case, there was a senior member of staff who, in fact, died, I believe. So they, they, they were largely, but not entirely, small laboratories um, that wound down through natural staff turnover. Um, I think the... Um, San Antonio is a different um, situation. That was a laboratory that was established purely, we were told, to cope with the additional capacity for this particular contract. And once the uh, contract was no longer being provided by CPL, they closed down the San Antonio laboratory. So there were a variety of reasons, but as far as I recall, we were never told uh, uh, or shown any evidence or found any evidence that any of these laboratories had been shut down because of complaints or other adverse findings at the time. Yeah. So on so, sorry, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Well, could I just add, you know, this issue of very small laboratories troubles me. That's why I was essentially troubled about Salford. Uh, and it's not a good thing for professionals not to be working in a team. So therefore the closure of small... And, and I, I know Dr Denton and I, in, uh, in our previous uh, roles, uh, responsible for screening in the in the region of southwest of England, has put a lot of time into closing labs yes. uh, and, and stopping them doing screening work because small labs are just bad news. Generally speaking, insofar as you were able to ascertain, yeah. uh, there was no reason other than natural causes, as it were, for closing down the labs, oh. uh, and there was no ulterior motive uh, or, Not that we came or no attempt to withhold evidence or information in that closure. Not that we came across. Next, uh, my next question, Madam Chair, is in relation to, uh, you, you mentioned, Doctor, that dealing with errors uh, in the system uh, wasn't uh, fit for purpose. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you believe that the system is sufficiently updated now uh, to deal uh, with, with errors and to deal with them effectively? Well, my, my, my comment was really um, about what happens when things go wrong. And I made the point when I was, the day I was appointed, I, I remember making the point that when things go wrong, uh, people generally want three things. They want to know the truth about what went on. Uh, they want to know, they want to know that it will not happen to anyone else. And they would really like someone who was responsible and involved to say sorry to them. 
And all the evidence shows that if you can achieve those three things, you uh, can resolve a huge number of, of, of uh, the concerns of the, the patients involved. Uh, and my experience uh, in dealing with the cervical check problem is that uh, people are often resorting to legal uh, action because they can't get any answers any other way. And I think that's a, a terrible pity. Um, it shouldn't be like that. Uh, and I'm not convinced that having gone through uh, a legal action, it necessarily gets you to the truth either because uh, uh, you know, judges are in a very difficult position, I think. They can only make a judgment on the basis of the evidence that is placed before them. Uh, it's not that they can uh, have an investigatory uh, element to their, their work. Uh, so and they have to decide a case uh, for or against. Uh, and I don't think that uh, necessarily brings uh, closure for people. And uh, I, I, you know, from talking um, to the women and, and the relatives, uh, they're interested in, 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 in knowing what went wrong and why it went wrong. And they'd really like someone to say sorry, particularly to the women who were so badly treated, many of them, in the open disclosure. They would like an apology and they would like it not in a letter from someone they've never heard of high up in the organization. They would like an apology from the people who didn't treat them properly. And I think those are all reasonable things. But our current system doesn't seem to me to provide an opportunity for, for that sort of process to even, happen. Even still? Oh, even still, yes. I think, I think that's true. I, I, I think that's uh, something that requires to be reflected upon uh, uh, and thought about over a period of time uh, in, in order to shift it. And I did mention, I know, I know uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, moving towards a um, no-fault compensation scheme, and, and that would be undoubtedly an assistance, but it still doesn't address those really basic fundamental uh, human needs of someone to say sorry and uh, someone to tell the truth and, 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 uh, and all that. So I think it, 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 need, it needs to be developed and preferably developed with, with patient advocates and patient safety advocates. Um, so I, I think a system could be developed. And I think for the reasons that I've laid out, uh, screening services are the right place for that to be taken, taken forward because of the nature of screening <coughs> services. Do you believe that um, a debate or dialogue between the clinicians and perhaps legal advisors and patient advocates uh, needs to take place now in order to bring about an ongoing improvement in the system. I do. With the view to, you do. Uh, and um, are, you, are you saying that it needs to be done as a matter of urgency? I, I, I'd, I'd rather it was done well. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it, it requires reflection. I, I, I'm hopeful that when, uh, when I'm allowed to finish my work on the inquiry that I can uh, put some time and effort into working with others uh, in, the, in, the, in the legal profession, in the medical profession, with patient advocates, uh, just to try and start some dialogue about how we can uh, address You will be making recommendations to that effect, uh, you, well, you hope. Well, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not leaving the field. Yeah. Uh, we, 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 we came to my attention, <coughs> and that's one of the gaps in the system, the consistency of the, of the evaluation process and the dealing with errors. What about gaps in the system, unforeseen uh, uh, gaps in the system that can occur, in, even in the best run organisations, from time to time? Uh, this could lead to errors, kind of errors, and in, 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 uh, in different businesses there, there are errors that cannot be helped, just take happen, and there are enforced errors. Uh, which, which shouldn't be happening. And uh, how, would, you, would you differentiate between the two? For example, the existence of either or both in terms of uh, delivering a quality of service that the women uh, who, who, who look for the service can have full confidence in. Um, I, I think there are a wide range of errors that uh, can occur. And, uh, in fact, uh, I think we've seen many of the range of, uh, of errors that uh, can occur illustrated in the, in the cervical check problems from, from uh, poor staffing, uh, not the right skill mix of staff, for example, in the in this construction of the screening programs. Um, I think we have uh, uh, seen di real failures of audit uh, in, the in the construction of what was a flawed audit. 
uh, failures in the transmission of information, key information between uh, the health service executive and the cancer registry in, uh, uh, in, in data about, about the occurrence of cancers. Uh, we've seen so many different er errors, really. Um, I think the way to address it is really from a patient safety perspective and I, and I look forward to the, uh, uh, the changes that are happening about giving a higher priority to patient, to patient safety. Uh, and uh, I, I think that is the way, the way to tackle it. And one of the best ways of tackling that is by encouraging patient advocates and, and promoting patient advocacy and involving patient advocates in, in all of the, the systems. Uh, <coughs> Do you, uh, are you satisfied within reason that those issues can be addressed in terms of improvement to the quality and the reliability of the service? Of the screening service? Yes. Oh, I, I think they are being addressed. Uh, and as far as we have gone uh, in terms of reviewing the implementation of our recommendations, there is definite progress being, being made, definite progress being made. There is more to go, uh, more to be done and it will take a bit of time. But in terms of, uh, I, I, you know, I must pay tribute to some of the people in the HSE who've taken it on, uh, and they've, they've, done a, they've done a good job and they've made some good appointments, and uh, there is more to be done. And uh, I, I will be returning to this now that we've finished this uh, supplementary report um, and finished the, the inquiring part. <coughs> we will be looking at the implementation of the recommendations and coming back to the Minister with a report on the implementation. You mentioned two, 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 two points, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to a conclusion, uh, Chair, maybe Deputy that's no. uh, that uh, non-disclosure should not have happened, yes. Uh, but it, 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 the, the fact of it did not necessarily have an impact on the welfare and well-being of the patients. Well, I, I, I think it's more nuanced than this. Than, than that, sorry. Uh, it had a very big impact, I think. When they learnt of the non-disclosure, it had a very big impact. Uh, and, uh, in terms of confidence? In terms of their confidence, absolutely. And uh, I think I illustrate this. Uh, the, the thing that illustrated it for me, and I recounted it, I think, in my first report, or touched on it, was at one of the early uh, meetings with uh, the, uh, uh, the women and, and the relatives. Uh, uh, two young women came in and... Uh, sat beside each other and they discovered they knew each other actually, they were from the same area and uh, both of them were talking about how uh, the non-disclosure had affected them and both of them had lost confidence in their clinician and both of them independently were thinking of shifting to the other person's, the other woman's clinician and uh, they stood up and told this, it was uh, about the only humorous part of that entire meeting and uh, but it, it, it was they found it humorous but it was tragic because they had lost confidence in their clini clinician and if you are uh, if you have a serious illness like cervical cancer you really want the confidence in your clinician more than anything else so uh, the non-disclosure I think had a very devastating effect on, on many women do you think that um, the non-disclosure uh, elements and the lack of confidence arising from us can be addressed and is likely to be addressed. And do you think as well, in your opinion, that the clinicians uh, and, and the, all those involved, laboratories or other, in any shape or form, are sufficiently impressed on the need uh, to be frank with their patients, to disclose the information to the patients as and when it, it, it becomes available to them? Yeah. as opposed to concealing the information from them. Yeah, I, I think we're on a, a, on a journey here, and um, I, I know the HSA have produced a, a, a new open disclosure policy, which is an improvement on the past policy. Um, it remains to be seen how that will be implemented, how much resource they will put into the, 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 the training process. So, I mean, one of my criticisms in my main report was that they put very little resource into implementing uh, their, their, their previous policy. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very uh, encouraged by the discussions that have taken place between some of the patient advocates involved in, in the 2-1 two, two, and, the, and uh, some of the leaders of the medical profession at the highest level. And those have been very fruitful and I, I know they've had an effect on the thinking at the, at the top of the, the profession. So I, I think it, it, we're, at the, we're at the beginning of a, a, a long process here. But when I... I, I'm, I'm optimistic that there will be progress made, 
Would a code of and this is the last question, Madam Chairperson. Uh, would a code of conduct uh, be of any assistance? One would have well, I think I, I, expected I'm, that. Yeah, I'm a great believer in uh, codes of conduct. I was uh, on the General Medical Council in the UK for ten years, and, and, and we introduced uh, a quite a rigorous uh, 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 code at that time. And uh, in my first report, I, I was. Uh, not particularly happy with some of the content of the uh, Irish Medical Council's code, and particularly the use of the uh, their, their, their use of the word "should" rather than "must." That's what it's summed up. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, I don't think open disclosure uh, is an optional extra. It has to be has absolutely to be. at the core of everything the professionals do. So I, I hope someone at some stage in, in, in uh, the next year or two, reviews all of the, code of conduct, the codes of conduct for all of the health professionals to see what is in there and, and to, to ensure that uh, the expectations of all our health professionals, uh, that those expectations include that they should be open, frank and honest with, with, with patients. You know, and, that, and that includes the ability of, of health professionals to say when they don't know something and when they are uh, uncertain. Uh, about something. I think uh, that, that sort of honest dialogue is absolutely crucial. And that adherence to the Code of Conduct actually protects the clinicians and the institutions and confidence in the system. It does indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Durkin. Um, and just very briefly before I come to Deputy O'Connell, um, with reference to the laboratories that were closed, you expressed a view about whether or not there had or there had not been any adverse incidents. Did you investigate that or is that just your impression? Uh, well, I, um, Dr. Denton, I think, will address it's, that. Uh, it, it's, it's very difficult because many of the former provider laboratories have not provided for many, many years. So um, many of them had only done it for a short period of time back in 2008, 9, 10. Um, so we... Um, there, you know, there was a limit to how much information we could get, but we were never told uh, of any laboratory that had closed due to an adverse incident. Uh, and we would have asked specifically, and I can't recall exactly, okay. but I think we did. Thanks very much. Deputy O'Connell, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you again um, mm -hmm. for, for your work. Um, I suppose we all have different roles here, so um, I apologise in advance. Um, I want to focus on the guy in Salford or in Manchester first. Yes. And um, my concern is, is that I have never heard of retrospective accreditation. To my mind, accreditation is competence to do a test. It's a bit late after you have the test done. I'm concerned about, and I read the report when it came out, and I had to read it again last night, but how could you assume that the lack of accreditation had no impact? My argument would be, and I'd love to be wrong on this, I hope I'm wrong, if you have a test where there's a sensitivity range or a 70% accuracy, and there's a guy, or a woman, we call him a guy for, for, for this point in time, and he's getting a certain amount of slides, and they're going into the mix with the rest of the lab slides, <coughs> med lab slides. Now, I do know from the last meeting we had that on the slide, it actually says what lab it was done in. I'd imagine that's how you found out. Maybe it's not. But when you throw his slides in with all the other slides, and you take in all the things we've discussed over a year or whatever, different cohorts of patients, you can't defend... If that lad, and I, I'm trying to be as helpful as possible, if that lad had just left the slides in the car, in the boot of the car, and if when the deadline to return them arrived and if he brought them in and he just signed his name on the end of it if he never tested them wouldn't have any material difference on the on the, the end figures because he was doing so few if he was never his baseline never tested or the lab's baseline how can you definitively say <clears throat> theoretically i believe he could have left all the slides in the boot of the car Yes, I think Dr. Denton will be able to answer that. Yes, so um, cervical check very diligently collected individual screener data. Sorry, who did? Cervical check. Yeah. So they had a, a standard uh, return form uh, called CYTO-1, which uh, listed 
each individual screener in a coded, anonymised way. Um, in, in, in America, Salford, yeah, Sandiford, yeah, everywhere? Everywhere, yeah. <clears throat> and, Always? Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, they were, that, that was one piece of information that was collected. So, had there been um, a screener who did what you suggest, uh, I do believe that would have been detected. Definitely. The system that was in place should have detected that. I don't think we ever heard about a list of screeners before in here. I, I don't ever remember hearing it, it's that. In, it is in the original <coughs> So report. all the screeners yeah. in all the labs, Mr X, his, 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 his sensitivity rate, that, that's all documented. Yes. They will be given a number. It wouldn't be. Yeah. Well, it's it's not yeah. person, uh, whatever. And yeah. uh, in relation to software, you see, MedLab operated that really as a satellite. So the IT systems and everything was a, it, mm -hmm. were identical. So that screener was a numbered uh, a screener within the returns uh, from mm -hmm. uh, from MedLab Dublin, and yeah. uh, those returns have been looked at. Correct. Uh, so. Uh, we he was be, looked at, so as an individual, we yes. know his, can you say, competency at, at an level? At, yes, at an individual level. We yes. know the competency, right? Uh, we know that there is no identifiable problem. Yeah, but if you've, if you've arranged, okay, this is reassuring. So if you have arranged 70% sensitivity, but in some cases, you know, 85, 90%, yeah. if he was at the lower end, and if the patient cohort was young and unlikely to have cervical cancer, it, it, he could technically be an outlier, could he? Uh, well, it, there are, well, there are a number of checks. There's, there's also, of course, uh, each slide is examined twice. Uh, so there's uh, what's looked at. In Salford, but not in America. Oh, in America yes. as well, yes. All right. uh, yes, could I, could I just uh, Yeah, cor I want to get that? to that too. I don't want to spend too because I've no, 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 no. time. No, 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 very quickly, very quickly. Yeah. Uh, the standard process in the States has always been that they, for American women, yeah. uh, will look at, uh, be screened once. Yeah. Uh, for the Irish slides, part of the contract was that they were screened twice by two separate And do screens. we know that when they sent them off to the secret labs that the same standard applied? Did they, so when they went, when they subcontracted uh, out to the lab down the road, yeah, did we, they apply the Irish standard or the we, American we, standard? We, no, no, they were all applied the second. Right. Uh, uh, and, and we've seen the, the data for the number of first screens carried out in each lab and secondary screens carried yeah. out in each lab, which clearly indicates that they were seen twice. So th there are two checks. There's the, the, uh -huh. the individual check, uh, and then there's the concordance between the, the, t the two. And you would note a difference in, in, in the results from the, the, the two. So in, um, in 2009, there was a big document produced by um, a group, but the, the, the standards for quality assurance, this lad, this document, 320 pages. And I had a little look at it last night. And then the same document on e-tenders changed. That was in 2009. 2012, so in 2009, it's very comprehensive. If the, 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 there's a this very comprehensive group of people fed into it, chaired by Gronia Flanley. And it talks about ISO accreditation. I know we've been around the block on this, yeah. and you've addressed it in your report, but I'm still not happy in terms of... <laughs> I'm just really uncomfortable with it. In the 2009 document, it says it has to be ISO accredited. Mm -hmm. In the 2012 iteration, it says ISO are equivalent. Did you find out anything along your way as to who made that decision? Who, who uh, diminished the standard? Uh, Who's responsible for well, that action? I, I don't believe we didn't, uh, saw in any documentation who was. It, I'm kind of suspicious of it. And you know how I feel about this. And I've yeah. read, obviously, your document a few times. But at the end of the day, if I say I want, and ISO is international, it's, you know, it's, it's a proper accreditation. I know you've basically said six and one half does is really what you've said in your report. Yes. But the fact remains that when we went out, we said we wanted ISO. The contract happened. In the contract it says, we want ISO. The contracts were signed. They weren't. They were Co College of American Pathology. I thought perhaps the labs were in breach of contract. I think I read that somewhere along the way. But really, 
If we were, f we, whoever was in charge at the time, were fool enough to sign a contract with the wrong standard, it's our fault, I would argue, not the company's fault. Um, and then, for some bizarre reason, in 2012, this thing, yeah. or the e-tender, it changed to equivalent. And I'm suspicious as to who did that. Did someone cop on somewhere along the way that it was different? Was this emerging slowly over time? I'm just suspicious of yeah. how that changed. Uh, did you get to the bottom of that? Uh, I, I don't know who was responsible for the, for the change. Um, but, but in fact, either, either way it was wrong, because uh, when they specified ISO, and as you correctly said, a lot of the labs didn't have ISO, they had a different system. Uh, uh, there, was, there was no challenge of that that we could find any correspondence about at all. And even though they inserted or equivalents, uh, we saw uh, no correspondence that would indicate that uh, anyone had ever asked uh, HSE to judge uh, the CAP as equivalent. No. So it was uh, uh, it, it, that, along with other aspects of the contract, were not actually, never actually implemented properly. The contracts were not properly implemented properly. They were not properly. Placed. It was. It was. It was. It was doomed from the start. That's how I, I how I see it um, um, now. And I mean, INAB's position in all this. INAB are the the, the accrediting group. They have a very serious role. They are aligned with their international counterparts. Would you be concerned about the retrospective accreditation issue as, as somebody who I'm sure is all about standards? And to follow on from, from Deputy Kelly's questioning, you know, how we could have ended up where the lab was never visited, the, 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 even there's limitations in INAB's thing, how outside the jurisdiction. It ticks so many boxes that were wrong. I'm really concerned, and I think that's why we have to bring INAB into the committee, um, because if, 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 if we are seen to have a lab accreditation body not accrediting labs or retrospective or messing about, it's very serious in terms of our labs. And just, and I know you're nodding and I'll be cut off, but I'll stay here for the evening. Um, like, I looked last, I looked last yeah, night, the same at, way I looked last I night at, at various, um, I, I'd never gone anti tenders before. And, you know, the, 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 the questions that other companies ask, they put up there. So the questions are asked, so labs apply for tenders and they're not actually accredited and they're told, they can see the answer from before, that, you know, this isn't good enough. So it, it, it's all there already. And um, in terms of, I, I was, a guy doing um, veterinary lab work in Ireland. He was trying to do some state work. And, um, you know, it's very, very clear in the history of the correspondence. It takes about a year to get INAB accreditation. It's a long process. So it's not a case of the lad in, in Sandyford ringing up and saying, is it good to go? Yeah. It's not like that. And there's almost an impression out of this. It's just, you know, a tick, a tick box exercise. But getting a lab accredited is really, really serious. And I think we really have, we do have to bring them back. We need to bring them in here to find out what the hell they were at, who thought it was okay. Did someone ask them to retrospectively accredit their lab? Why would they retrospectively accredit a lab? Why would anyone do that? Why would INAB ever expose themselves like that for a private company? To me, it's really, really concerning. Uh, yes, I, absolutely, Debbie. I, I mean, I share that. Uh, we have unanimity on that one. We, we, we have, and the important thing is not, not the date of who knew what around anything in, in, in February. The issue, that, the issue of accreditation. Because uh, we've, we've been basing a lot of our work on the, on the fact that the accreditation system is in operation. So we're concerned about, really concerned, to check that places are accredited. And we need an accreditation system that everyone can rely on. So I had expected another outcome to this, to tell you the truth. I had expected that INAB would tell me, we've never heard of this lab. We've never visited this lab. Of course it's not accredited. And that's not the answer that, that I got back, which, which, which is why I, I think I, I expressed it as it's the straining 
uh, credulity or credibility, really. And I, I, I absolutely share that. Do you, you know? like I think as legislators, we'd be really concerned about this. If INAB, they're under jobs, they're getting state funding, their job is to accredit labs. And if they're like going, that's grand lads, keep going, retrospective. I mean, if that is really what's going on, it's really, really concerning because our standing internationally is really important. We can't have that. Um, gosh, where do you start? The waiting, I know uh, Deputy O'Reilly brought this up. Um, was that around the 2012? When did the change of waiting go from money being more important than quality? When did that happen? Uh, there were three iterations of the contract. Um, there's a tabular representation of a deputy on page 34 actually so you'll see there are the three contracts so yeah the three, three so did this it started do, 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 the waitings between so to 15 percent in 2012 did it happen sort of gradually over that period, or did it happen in 2012? No, those were the dates in, in which the tender processes were operated. So what you see there in the table on page oh. 34 are the percentage weightings that applied in those tender exercises. So, let me see now, do, 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 do. what am I looking at? So it changed from quality assurance 18 to 15. So actually there was a good drop in 2010. Yeah, I think that the, well. the critical one that would um, denote concern in our minds is that the fee aspect doubled from 2008 to 2012. Yeah, cost was more important. To the point that that would have outweighed every well, Definitely other nobody with a clinical background made that decision, I'd argue. And um, it, as said earlier, it, it was difficult to try and find out why those decisions were reached as to why the, the percentages changed because the documentation no longer exists. And finally. We spent a lot of time, and I, I read a few transcripts last night from the committees about quality assurance. We were assured here, um, not here, but PAC, I think it was, um, and you weren't involved, that there was quality assurance visits going on. And sometimes some pathologist went over, went back in the transcripts last night, and then there was sort of random visits. Did you get anywhere? Did you find out, obviously you didn't know about half the labs, but did you find out how many QA visits were made? And what was the trigger for them? Was it like an invite from the lab? Was it weather being particularly good in a part of America? What was the trigger for the QA? And do we know what happened when they went on their QA visits? So was it a cup of tea or was it sit down? Because it seems to have, anyway, you can let me know. <laughs> so the, the QA visits were scheduled, they were part of the, um, specification which the laboratories agreed with and they were initiated by cervical check. Um, the, uh, there wasn't really um, a definite adequate um, program or policy or specification for what the QA visits would uh, entail and that was something that was raised in, um, in the original um, report. So what you're saying is people were going on QA visits but they didn't actually have a list of what they were going to do when they get, got there. Would that be a fair summary? More or less, yes. Yeah. And do we know what sort of people were going? Were they the doctors? Were they the, these people that were rolling around in cervical check? Who were the people going yeah, over? Yeah, we do know who, who, who yeah. um, did the QA visits and yeah. it did include um, a uh, external expert cytopathologist um, uh, um, and external. also staff from cervical check. And that was, the, the expert um, psychopathology, were, were they, was it the same one used for every visit? Yes. Same expert. And we did attempt to contact that psychopathologist, but they were not available to us. Of course us. they weren't. Um, who else? People from Cervica? Y yes. Can we have the names, or is that? Um, we, you can have the names, but, we, but not, not sure available we, to me at the moment. Yeah. We didn't. Yeah. Yeah with the grade even or the yes. you if, know. If, yeah. if, what I'm looking for is I want to know how many visits who was on them this expert where was it where was the expert got from was there a 
tendering process for an expert, wherever they got you, I don't know, you know, wherever they keep people like you. Um, like, who was on it? Was there clinical people? Were there doctors on it? Were there GPs? I, ass I would have assumed that, that there was the people actually doing this marriage. I want to know what they were at. No, we do know the composition, but, uh, yeah. and it did include the uh, cytopathologist, but that was the only clinician, I believe, that was part of the uh, QAT. You need to bring one expert. One, one expert pathologist. And yes. did you find out what they were at when they went over? So they didn't have any plan when they were going over, but do we know how long were they there? Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah we have reviewed the, the reports that they wrote. Um, they were in each laboratory for a full day. Which is, um, sorry, each of what laboratories they Oh, each of the about. laboratories they visited. So <laughs> they've, so, um, which we've established didn't include many of the, mm -hmm. um, the places to which the work was actually being sent. We've never seen any indication that the, the people who did the QA visits were made aware that some of the work was going offside. So how many labs were they visiting? Was it three or five or seven? Uh, so they visited... Um, did they visit all the labs we knew about? When? <laughs> the principal visits yes. would have been to Teterborough in New Jersey and to Austin, Texas. Yes. And what was surprising, I think, to us in relation to the visit to Austin, Texas, was that at the time that those visits took place, a very large proportion of the work that was going to Austin was actually then being shipped out to San Antonio, which, as had been mentioned earlier, was a, a small laboratory set up specifically and solely for the purpose of servicing the cervical check work. But despite the fact that the visit was done at the time when that work was being shipped down to San Antonio, what sort of proportion of the work was it? Like ninety percent of the slides were going off somewhere else. It's about, I think it's about just under forty percent of the work that was going through Austin was being shipped to. So you're San telling Antonio. me, and just in case, because it's important, we were a QA or a self-appointed QA team, self-accredited QA team, were going over. They went over to Austin, Texas with this expert external cyclopathologist. At the time, 40% of the stuff was going to San Antonio, and no one, everyone came home delighted, none the wiser about San Antonio. They were completely unaware of that. Uh, when we visited Austin, I think within about 10 minutes of us going into the building, they had disclosed to us that a large proportion of the work went to San Antonio. And you're going to get us the list, how many days they were there. Who funds those? We have a budget for them. Who, who, who paid yeah, for those visits? Yeah. Oh, funded by cervical check, yeah. On behalf of, they were visiting on behalf of cervical check, so they would... Mm. So we're going to get a document with where they went, who was there. Uh, yes. I, 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 I'm not sure who, could, who would properly be the be, uh, best organisation to provide you with. The HSE might well be because it was on their behalf that the visits took place. We'll provide you with that information. It was on all our behalves. On all our behalves, mm. indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Um, Sorry for my absence. Uh, you have a, another question, and we might even get um, Dr. Denton and uh, Diabel Scali out before five. Oh, I think we will. I think yes. we will. Yes, and, uh, and the chair. Just so you know, you, the, the, the session was ably chaired in your absence. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I'm much more of a pushover chair. I, gave, I would give everybody a lot of a leeway. So, um, my quite look, I, I shared the, <laughs> I, I don't know if horror is too strong a word, but I'm going to say horror because actually it, it is, it, it's, you know, the, the idea that people were on quality assurance uh, visits and they somehow didn't pick up that they were not in the place where they should have been at, or, or where the majority of tests were taken. But anyway, that, notwithstanding that, just in relation to the, the letter we were given here dated the 15th of February from yourself, Dr. Scally, to the minister. The last line of it says, I add that I have found no reason to revise the view that I took in my main report, namely that as far as I can be ascertained, all the current laboratories have performance which is acceptable in their country. Yes. Okay, so um, I, I have no reason to, to revise the opinion, I mean, you know, that to me that's not a massive ringing endorsement, but that doesn't matter because we, we know that there's no, you know, that, that there was a lot, of, a lot of missing information, so you couldn't necessarily make that judgment. But when you say performance which is acceptable in their country, presumably there's a variation in standards across different jurisdictions. Yes. 
There's a very, well, there's a, there are several variations across jurisdiction. Would you like to uh, 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 address that? Um, well, I, I mean, I suppose the bottom line is that it's extremely difficult to find out what the actual sensitivity of a test is. It's, it's you know, how, how, would you, how would you find that out? The only uh, way that you um, are actually able to get to a fairly robust answer is in the context of randomised controlled trials, and they're obviously not possible um, or desirable in this mm. setting. So, um, you know, we have to look at um, other markers, um, things that, that are based very much on process. So, as we've mentioned before, there's the issue about do you screen a slide once, do you screen it twice? Um, and obviously, if you have two separate people screening it, then you're going to pick up more abnormalities than if mm. only one person screens it. So, um, uh, but but the, um, the US requirement is for only one person to screen the US derived slides and then to do a 10% mm. uh, re screen. So 90% so of their negative slides are only being screened by one person. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, clearly what was being offered and what is being offered still to the uh, Irish women. Um, in those settings is is better because they are all having two screens. Um, so we we're not able to say um, that the sensitivity of the test in country A is this and in country B it's that because it is simply not measurable. Mm. Um, but what we can say is that the 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 processes um, are that are being used are. Um, as is specified and acceptable in the countries that they're being used. No, I th see. I think that's where the that, that's where my issue is. Mm -hmm. So um, we know that some countries compare more favourably than others for all, all sorts of things, for, mm -hmm. for for a whole range of things. So saying that your performance is the same as we we'll say, uh, you know, a, a, a third world or emerging economy jurisdiction, is not the same thing as saying it's of a sufficiently high standard. So if we consider ourselves to have a high standard then saying that well you know by comparison with country a country a has relatively low standards but all of the yes. all of the labs perform to the standards that is required within their country so there's different standards in the states than there is here there's a lot of unknowns because there were labs testing um that, that they've now closed and the people as far as we we know have never set foot in or done any kind of uh you know, on-site quality assurance. Um, so, I, I'm just <laughs> that. That's a little bit disturbing. Say, to say, uh, well, it's you know up to their standard, which may not be up to our standard. I, I, I completely understand, and it is a very difficult mm. issue. For example, one of the uh, one of the other differences is that the uh, and Dr. Dental gave me right on this uh, here. Uh, a slide is examined twice. twice. Mm. Uh, one of those is a primary screen, which is for a longer period of time than the secondary screen. Mm -hmm. And that's the norm in the UK mm -hmm. and Ireland. In the United States, they don't do secondary screens. So the Irish women slides that went to the States had two primary level screens, mm -hmm. which are uh, uh, which involve the cyber screener um, examining site for a longer period of time. So in theory, one would postulate that they should have fewer false negatives because they're having more intensive screening, mm -hmm. but it does make the data not easily comparable with anywhere else. So uh, those are the, the sort mm -hmm. of complications that make comparability really difficult. Mm -hmm. Thank and yet, on the, on the on the basis of that, you, you were able to to ascertain confidence. Well, I, I, you know, my language is very careful around that, as you uh, as you, you will see. I mean, on the basis of the information available to us, uh, and our professional judgment is that we uh, have not found uh, serious deficiencies in the screening uh, in any of the laboratories. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And before I finish with um, Deputy Donnelly, could I just ask, and perhaps the question has been asked uh, in my absence, in, in relation to carrying out an audit, and it was the carrying out of the audit that has led to 
what's been going on now for the past uh, year and a bit. Is it the gold standard of a screening program to, to do an audit, which is, uh, this one was a named audit, or would an unnamed anonymous audit, audit be a better way of reviewing the situation? Well, I don't, uh, there isn't a common pattern of audit in the screening programmes. In fact, they, they, they differ quite markedly where they are carried out at all. Uh, I, I know Dr. Denton uh, has, this is a matter that uh, she's been uh, discussing with colleagues internationally of late. Would you like to comment? Um, so, uh, I think that in many countries the issues of doing a named audit are um, only just becoming, to, becoming apparent. Uh, I think there's a history of people thinking that it would be a really good thing to do and always with the best of motives that they want to learn about where things have gone wrong, how things could be improved, perhaps use it to focus uh, training or new skills development, always good motives, but actually um, failing to think through some of the consequences uh, um, and to plan in advance for how they're going to deal with the information. So, um, I, you know, anonymised audits have been done in some places, um, I believe. It's not been normal practice in the UK, certainly, or in um, any other European country that I'm aware of. Uh, the, the challenge is really that you can't do this in a completely anonymised way because it's not just about reviewing the cervical cytology preparations. You have to look at the, the patient history. You have to look at when did they attend for screening. Um, did, were they invited correctly? Did, did the colposcopy and the uh, follow-on investigations, were they all done correctly? You can't just take one bit of the pathway and do that. And in order to link all that information, of course, you have to de-anonymise it. So it's actually very difficult to do a whole screening programme um, audit anonymously. To come back to the audit then, if, if, if you are going to do an audit, which is the gold standard, I presume, to, to do an audit, to, to assess the, the quality and the accuracy of your reading. In, in doing that, are you then setting yourself up to what has happened to the 221 women who have been identified as having a discordant uh, reading? I mean, will the audit open uh, that level of litigation and um, anxiety and worry and what we've seen for the past year. Not to say that it shouldn't be done, but if you do an audit, are you now putting the programme at risk? Um, I, I think audit should always be done. I, I think the decline in, 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 in clinical audit, medical audit over the, the last uh, decade or two is, uh, is deeply regrettable. Uh, I, I think it's a question of how it's done and uh, the purpose for which it's carried out and the rigour with which uh, it, it, it's applied. Uh, but also that um, in the, the conception of the audit, uh, there has to be attention paid to the communication of the results of that audit uh, and what the, what the aftermath of any errors that are found is. And it's a, a bit like what I was saying earlier. We, we don't have a good system um, for dealing with uh, clinical error when it when it occurs and, and uh, responding as a society to clini clinical error and the audit can't just be uh, a, an audit that is uh, uh, entirely clinically driven without paying attention to all of those downstream elements and in some places in some jurisdictions I, I think those elements are, are so difficult to deal with uh, that they don't do audits they rely instead on accreditation they rely upon quality assurance uh, they rely on, on training uh, in order to uh, generate uh, uh, assurance that the, the system is good because it's a very difficult area to get into. In your first report you mentioned moving to a no-fault compensation scheme. Is, is that the, is, is, is that, would that solve the issue of, of litigation? Well, I, I, it was in this report, in fact. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, yes, and uh, I, I, 
as part of a package, but I, th I think it, it has to involve the other elements of, of the truth-telling, of the, uh, uh, the, the support for the person, etc., etc. And uh, I, I, you know, I'm very struck by uh, the scheme for dealing with vaccination in the UK, which has been operating for quite some time now, and uh, they have a, a compensation scheme for that, and uh, it has operated successfully. Uh, uh, and, uh, and avoid it. Sorry? I think there's a line about that in the programme for government uh -huh. about replicating. Yes, that. E exactly. Uh, and as I said in my report, I think the, the, a good place to start here is with the, the screening programmes, these public health programmes, because they differ so dramatically. It's not sick people coming to see uh, you, Dr. Harty, or, 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 or any doctor. These are well people, and on behalf of the state, the state has decided to run this. Uh, program for the whole population. So the state is reaching out to these people and is offering them a service for their benefit but also for the state's benefit. So therefore I think we have a particular duty of care towards patients who are involved in that and that includes a duty of caring for them if the system uh, fails them in any way. Thank you. And Deputy Donnelly. Thank Mr. you. <clears throat> Um, I'd just like to, <clears throat> excuse me, I'd just like to finish off if I could on your two recommendations. Um, the first is that it is, it is made even more explicit in the contracts between the HSE and the labs that there can be no unilateral onward contracting. So the, the, the primary contractors can't just go off and subcontract the work. Now that's already in, as you've said, that's already in the, the, <clears throat> the contracts, um, but you'd like it made more explicit. And your second recommendation is that there should be a consistent quality assurance process developed and essentially implemented globally. So cervical check or the HSC is not saying we look at whatever your accreditation is that it flips and says actually we're not interested particularly in what the accreditation in your country is. This is our accreditation and this is what you need to meet. Um, I'm curious as to, as to as to why what happened happened in terms of the subcontracting. Yes. So the HSE uh, contracted in good faith and it turns out that the lab subcontracted. I'm not going to say whether or not that was in bad faith but it certainly seems to have been in breach of contract. Um, one of the things that is, is certainly one of the observations I've found as we've started looking at cervical check is we all think of these kind of state programs as these well-resourced, um, well-financed, very slick operations with plenty of staff and plenty of doctors and plenty of accountants and plenty of lawyers and plenty of administrators to do all the work that needs to be done. What I've seen in cervical check was what, uh, what really was a world-class program but actually been run very much on spit and boot polish that it was, it was about half of uh, Dr. Flannelly's time and there was a very small staff, really. Um, there were, the, there were the, the staff processing the slides and doing, doing, doing all of that work. And then the, the, the management staff was, was, was very, very small. And so can I ask, it, is it your conclusion that the reason that the HSE stroke cervical check never spotted this subcontracting is that they didn't actually have the required expertise, which is a legal expertise, this is serious stuff. This is contract enforcement, uh, contract supervision, you know, the ability to go and do all of these on-site audits. Is it the case that they didn't actually have the facilities to do it? Or is it the case, do you think, that they, they did have the facilities and this is something that something they should have spotted and failed in their duty to spot. That's on, on your first recommendation. The second question on that is, and where are we at today? Because it's, it's one thing for us all to talk about what the good people of Cervical Check should be doing in terms of contract enforcement. And then to your second point, which is a very reasonable point, develop a robust global quality assurance protocol and enforce it. There's no point having a document on the shelf. That means you've actually got to have the, the, the scientists, the doctors, the lawyers, the accountants, whoever it is, to get on planes, physically travel. So, um, thank you, Chair. Um, did they have 
the requisite firepower to do it or not? Yeah. And do they now have the requisite firepower to implement properly these recommendations? Uh, those are good points. I, I, I don't think they had the, the capacity, either in terms of the uh, sheer quantum of staff nor the skill mix. Uh, one of my concerns, uh, you mentioned Dr. Flanley, I think she was two days a, a, a week. Uh, she was a colposcopist, yet here is a programme, as we know, <laughs> is very heavily based on cytopathology, and they had no in-house cytopathology expertise, uh, which I, I find really difficult. Uh, it's a public health programme, and there was uh, no consistent public health input uh, into this, which I, I'm quite sure would have avoided some of the, the problems with the construction of the audit. And, uh, I, 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 and uh, I think that left them very weak. Uh, the contracting and tendering uh, arena, I mean, Mr. McQuillan might want to comment on, on their capacity in, in relation to that, but it, it looked to me to be light uh, mm. uh, as well. Uh, and in term, terms of the... Uh, they did not manage these contracts. The contracts should have been actively managed. They were passive recipients of what the laboratories chose to give them. Is, it would be my summary of it. And they, they need the capacity to actively uh, manage it. Now, in terms of going forward, uh, I think one of the uh, uh, positive things is that uh, uh, Mr. McQuillan and I have been, for quite a long time, uh, uh, on behalf of the Department of Health, uh, over the years, looked at the public health system and uh, the organization of uh, public health medicine in. Uh, in this data, and, and it hasn't been good. And uh, that public health weakness, I think, is to the detriment of uh, health and health services in all sorts of ways. And I'm very pleased that there are no actions being taken to strengthen that. And hopefully, these very important public health programs will uh, operate within uh, a staffing structure that can actively manage the programs and manage them on public health principles to deliver maximum benefit for the population. And just to thank summarise you, then, just to find a tiny bit, thank you Chair, right now do you believe uh, Cervical Check has the capacity to implement I, these I two think, recommendations? I, I think they have, uh, certainly as far as the professional realm is concerned, uh, acquired the, uh, the staffing that, they, that they, okay. they need at the moment. Uh, in terms of contracting and tendering, mm. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, we will certainly be looking at it as part of our uh, review of the implementation of the right. recommendations. I'd like, I'd like to just come in on that, deputy. As far as the contracting and tendering and the business side of things is concerned, uh, we would we'd be aware that the HSE have taken very good steps towards strengthening that considerably. And I think it's fair to say that it's probably flipped the other way now in terms of what was light and weak before is now very, very strong. And we're still looking at that and we'll be reporting on that in the coming mm -hmm. months. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Be responsible for it. Uh, our witnesses missing their flight, so thank you. Do you know when the San Antonio visit was that you referenced, Mr. McQuillan? Well, they didn't visit San Antonio. Sorry, the other one, the, the place, the one, the place, Texas, was it Austin? When that visit was? Uh, 2010, I think it was. 2011. 2011, 2011 I'm advised. Um, and just the, the lab in Sandyford is ISO accredited, isn't it? It is. Part of ISO accreditation, one of the rules I read last night, is that um, there has to be contingency plans and the subcontractors all must have ISO accreditation. So there is an issue there for the lab at Zandiford if they were subcontracting, isn't there in terms no, of... No, they weren't subcontracting, I think, I, their, they were just Their conception was... They think they have another lab that's that accredited. Their, their, their conception is that the setup in Salford and Greater Manchester and was an fine. actual part of the Sandy Ford lab, yeah. uh, even though it's in a different country. Yeah. Uh, and they would say that, though. It, well, yeah. Of course. And in terms of, I mean, like your, ex your experiences, Thank I mean, you deputy, are, deputy, are you... Just be conscious of you, the time. Are you... I'm all right for a minute. Are you, no, you know, they say the contracting and tendering is changing. I think this is sort of retrospective governance again. Are you shocked at what you found? I, I really, I, I think you are shocked. <laughs> I think Dr. Tent is definitely shocked. But I, I, to find these labs that weren't even known about, as somebody in, in your position, 
Like, have you ever seen the like of I've this? I've never seen the likes have of this you, in my long career. No, I really have not. No, you haven't, I imagine. No. Because I find reading it, and every time I read it, I, I find something else that I go, Jesus, what were they at? Like, are you really, in terms of governance, in terms of how people would go about delivering something, is it not about as bad as it gets? Would that be true to say? Well, is there I, any good bit? Uh, of it? It, 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 that would be overstating yeah. it. I mean, it, at no stage in all of my uh, inquiries have I found anyone acting with malign intent. Now, all too, oh, well. all too often, we have had cases of, of people who have been grossly incompetent and sometimes acting with malign in, in, intent. And unfortunately, that happens in the professions. But organisationally and structurally, I've never seen anything uh, quite as wrong mm. as this was from, from top and to bottom. I don't expect you to answer this question. But if what was going on in Serp and Czech is being replicated across the HSC, we do have a massive problem, wouldn't we? Uh, well, uh, yes, of course. You, uh, I, I, I've no reason to believe that it is, but that's a question, I think, to be posed to HSE rather than... Thank you very much, Deputy O'Connell, and we have actually finished on time. Uh, thank you very much for your conciseness. So, on, on behalf of the committee, uh, Dr. Scali, again, thank you very much for continuing to support the committee with, with your reports. And uh, just to finish, uh, I think it must be said that it is very important that women continue to <coughs> engage with cervical check, continue to participate in the screening programme, the 20% who don't need to be encouraged to, to engage and to be confident now uh, that the service is of an extremely high standard. I completely agree. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So on behalf of the committee, uh, Dr. Denton and Dr. Scally, um, and uh, I'm sorry, I can't. <laughs> Mr. McQuinnell, th thank you very much for coming in. This committee is now adjourned until next Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock. Thank you very much.